All right, the numbers are still climbing a little bit, but let's get going because we've got a lot of interesting things to uh, to discuss and to hear about today. Hello, bonjour, quoi. Welcome everyone and bienvenue à tous et à toutes. My name is Ray Sullivan. I work at CHRA and I'm coming to you from the unceded territory of the Gonquin Anishinaabe in Ottawa. And I know there are folks joining us from every corner of Canada on the territory of many First Nations of the Inuit and the Métis. And let's all remember in our housing work that we owe much gratitude and we owe justice to the Indigenous people whose land we occupy. Um, so use the chat uh, to let us know who's joining us and where you're joining us from. So the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association, CHRA, we are a membership-based organization and we're the national voice of the community housing sector. Our mission, this is like fresh off the presses of our new strategic plan, our mission is to provoke systems-wide change toward the right to housing. And if you aren't yet, a member of CHRA, please find us online and consider joining us. All right, on to today's webinar. Um, I've been a housing advocate for, for over two decades, and many times in my career, I have found myself incompetently, very incompetently, looking for data to support my work. That's one of the reasons I'm really excited that CHRA is able to bring you this webinar. Uh, we're welcoming the Housing Assessment Resource Tools team, the HART team, it is a research project funded by CMHC Housing Supply Challenge, and they've developed three tools, all very much data-driven, to really zoom in on how we measure and address housing need. The tools launched publicly at the end of March, but they are so brilliant, this team, they have kept updating them and developing them. They've added 2021 census data, uh, released new land assessment maps, a fantastic how-to guide for property acquisition, something dear to my heart, and they have some new stuff to share with us today. So I'm happy to hand this over to the HART team and we can all learn about the new tools and what's next. We have joining us with us, Craig Jones, who's the Associate Director of HART, Joe Daniels, the Property Acquisitions Coordinator and Cameron Power, the Land Assessment Coordinator. Over to you, my friends. Thanks, Ray. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Craig Jones. I'm the Associate Director of UBC's Housing Research Collaborative and, uh, and HART. I'm coming to you uh, today from the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth Nations. And as Ray said, uh, this project was funded through uh, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation's Housing Supply Challenge uh, Round 1, the data-driven solutions. <laughs> so, uh, and I will share my screen with you. Ray, is that looking okay? Great. So through the National Housing Strategy and the National Housing Strategy Act, the federal government has committed to progressively realize uh, the right to housing for everyone in Canada with an emphasis on the needs of the most marginalized populations. The goal of the HART project is to develop standardized, replicable, uh, equity-focused tools along with associated uh, public information and training to improve the quality of housing supply decision-making at all levels of government across Canada. Uh, with each of our tools, we work to address one key challenge uh, within the Canadian housing supply uh, landscape or policy. Uh, whether it's understanding housing need across Canada um, in a standardized fashion, the assessment of available public land for affordable housing, or strategies to preserve existing affordability. So the housing need assessment is a comprehensive tool that measures housing need and cost thresholds across relevant income categories, household sizes, and priority populations. And we include some uh, household projections. The land assessment is an equity focused tool that assesses scores and ranks available government land according to proximity to key services and amenities. And the property acquisition strategy is a policy driven framework they use the Canadian and international, international best practices to preserve existing affordable housing through acquisition of private sector buildings. Uh, today, I will be demonstrating our work on the HNA dashboard. Uh, my colleagues, Cam Power and Dr. Joe Daniels will be presenting on our land assessment and property acquisitions tools respectively. So a shared nuanced understanding of housing need across Canada is important. Um, we currently have various estimates of housing need. Housing need assessments can be expensive, employ different methods, use different data, um, which can make comparisons 
almost impossible. So with Heart, we have produced a Canada-wide equity-focused tool that is free to all communities to help them produce consistent, replicable, and comparable assessments of their housing need. We do this by basing our work on custom ordered census data, which is the most reliable source of data that covers the entire country. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first time that census data has been ordered according to a design that allows for the combination of income categories, household sizes, and equity deserving groups. Um, before I demonstrate the HNA dashboard, it's important to understand the income categories through which all of our data is organized. We have five income categories, which are defined by their relationship to area median household income, or AMHI, which was calculated for us by Statistics Canada for every single geography. Now, these income categories are uh, very low, which generally equates to shelter allowance for welfare recipients, low, which is generally equivalent to a full-time minimum wage job, median, oh sorry, moderate, which is approximately the starting salary for professional work, median, which represents the middle class, who can still struggle to move into home ownership, and high income, which accounts for about 40% of households across Canada. And we took this approach so that households can be understood relevant to the incomes of their community in which they have to find housing. We also show the percentage distribution of households according to each income category. We calculate the annual household income ranges associated with each category. And we show the affordable monthly shelter cost ranges which assumes that no more than 30% of household pre-tax income should be spent on housing. So for those of you who have seen, who have not yet seen our tool, I'm gonna to provide a brief introduction um, and I'll be covering new features and information available since our launch on March 31st. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Julia Harton, Assistant Professor at UBC's School of Community Regional Planning, for, uh, for her help in designing and really uh, thinking through the HNA dashboard. And also I'd like to thank Liquor Geospatial Consulting for uh, their work actually um, building this, this dashboard. Uh, so the HNA dashboard aligns with national, provincial and territorial census geographies and with census divisions and census subdivisions, which are general terms for regional planning areas and municipalities respectively. And so today I'm going to be going through the three uh, key elements of the HNA dashboard. Uh, the first is core housing need, the second is household projections, and the third is indigenous core housing need. Before we get into the demonstration, I should define core housing need. So a household is deemed to be in core housing need according to four criteria. So the household needs to be below one of the standards of Oh, at least one of the standards of affordability, suitability, and or adequacy. And critically, it would be impossible for that household to find another dwelling in their community that would meet their needs and also be affordable. So effectively, households in core housing need are stuck, unable to find an appropriate place to live. So uh, for this demonstration, we'll take a look at London, Ontario to begin with uh, in order to uh, choose any community in Canada. What you could, There are two ways to do that. Um, for the first, let's, let's find London. So London is in Ontario. Uh, it is in the region of Middlesex. And right here is London. And it's worth noting that as I was clicking through the map there, all of the information below was automatically updating with, with data for that relevant geography. The, the other way to uh, bring up uh, a community of interest for you is to click on the Select Census Geography box, uh, type in the name of the community, and to click on that name, and it will bring you to the same place. The first piece of information that is brought up is information on the income categories, the distribution of households within, the income ranges, and the affordable shelter cost ranges. The second uh, chart, well, the first chart, but the second piece of information that is brought up is the uh, rate of core housing need by income category. So we can see that in London, Ontario, about 60% of uh, very low and low income households are in core housing need, and about 13% of moderate income households are in core housing need. Amongst those households in core housing need, we dig a little further to look at the household size. 
So of the very low income households and low income households that are in core housing need, uh, we see that the majority of those households are one person. Um, but as we move up into the moderate and median income groups, we see uh, rising prevalence of three, four, and five person households. We report uh, in numbers uh, in this in this table in the affordable housing need uh, housing deficit table. So we can see that in London, Ontario, and this is 2016 data. We'll get into the update in a, in a, later on in the presentation. Uh, there were 23,000 ish households in core housing need. Of those households in core housing need, 17,000 were low income, and of that 17,000, uh, 9,000 almost 10,000 were low income one person households. So we can see that. The greatest nominal incidence of core housing need is amongst one person low income households, but we can also see that there is a distribution uh, across the household size. So we do see that there are four and five plus person households in core housing need, even though the preponderance is in the one person households. So uh, following the national housing strategy, we ordered data on a variety of priority populations identified for housing support. Uh, we did this so that every community can understand the housing needs of their vulnerable members and to allow for consistent reporting and tracking across communities and over time. The community-wide rate of core housing need is always highlighted in green. In this case, it's almost 15%. Uh, the priority population with the highest incidence of core housing need is always highlighted in uh, darker blue. So in this case, New migrant-led households, about 37% of new migrant-led households are in core housing need. And the second uh, priority population with a with this, the priority population with the second highest incidence of core housing need is single mother-led households at almost 33%. We can dig a little bit further into the priority populations that are in core housing need to get a sense of their income distribution. So for single mothers, we can see that um, many of them are low and very low. But they're also uh, about you know 30, almost 35 percent of the single mother-led households in core housing need have a moderate income. So great. So let's uh, move on to the household projections information. And in order to reset the map to go back to Canada, you just click on the reset map button, and uh, there you are. So our uh, current household projections are based on trends of uh, change from. 2006 to 2016, and we use a business as usual uh, projection method to go out to 2026. Now, it's worth noting that uh, since 2016, record immigration and significant movement within Canada means that these projections are almost guaranteed to underestimate household formation in high growth areas. So let's take a look at uh, West Vancouver. West Vancouver in Metro Vancouver. And the map is here. You can see that West Vancouver is here highlighted in green. So we uh, we show our projections by income category. Um, and so you can see that these are, this is the 2016 uh, pop household population. And uh, these are the projected changes by income category. We do the same for uh, projections, population projections for household size. Um, we report on the our anticipated total number of households by income category and household size up to 2026. And we also project the change that we might expect to see um, by income category and household size up to 2026. An additional feature that we have added is to include uh, growth rate comparisons between municipalities and their region, wherever that is possible. And so in this case, we can see in the District of West Vancouver that um, for the, the growth rate for every uh, income category is below that of the region, uh, which is Greater Vancouver or Metro Vancouver. And uh, for household size, we also see again that the growth rates for uh, the District of West Vancouver are below that of the growth rate of, of the region. So we um, do this for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is to allow for this kind of comparison to see how growth, you know, how one, one municipality's growth compares to its regional growth, but also to um, 
make a point that uh, in the cases where uh, growth has been slow or well below what we might expect uh, when looking at the region, that these projections may not be particularly useful for setting housing targets and another method should probably be employed. Core housing, so into indigenous core housing need. So um, at the request, urging, uh, suggestion of BC's Aboriginal Housing Management Association, we have added an analysis of Indigenous core housing need to the HNA dashboard. And this is important for every non-reserve municipality in Canada. So um, this, these data do not include housing on, on reserve. So in this case, we'll take a look at the city of Thunder Bay which updates right here in, in this region. So uh, again, the first piece of information is the income categories, the income distribution, the income thresholds and the shelter cost ranges. Uh, we see that amongst the very low and low income households, uh, the incidence of core housing need is about 60%. But even among the moderate income households who could afford a maximum shelter cost of $1,330, uh, there's almost a 30% uh, uh, incidence of core housing need amongst Indigenous households uh, in the city of Thunder Bay. Uh, again, we have that same information. We can dig in here. We see that amongst the very low income households, uh, largely, mostly uh, very uh, one person households, but amongst the low, moderate, and even and median income, we see a relatively higher uh, rate incidence of larger households. And then we can see that uh, amongst when we report the nominal numbers of households, indigenous households in core housing need, there were 1,500. The vast majority are low income. But interestingly, when we think about in comparison to, to, to London, Ontario, the uh, household size distribution is not the same. We do not have that same uh, concentration of one person low income households in core housing need. We actually see core housing need is distributed from one person to five plus person households. Uh, another function that we can we can use, we can do comparisons uh, between Thunder Bay, the city and the Th Thunder Bay region. So in this case, I'll look at the census division of Thunder Bay, bring that up, the map, map automatically updates. And looking at this, we see that the information is largely uh, similar, we, we, the pattern is repeated. And that is because when we are taking a look at the region of Thunder Bay, the overall incidence of core housing, the number of uh, households in core housing is only 800. So we've learned that when we're taking a look at the region of Thunder Bay, that indigenous core housing need is uh, largely located within the city of Thunder Bay. And so there's a, and there's a whole bunch of comparisons that can be done here. So we've only added this functionality uh, for indigenous households, but our uh, uh, data, and our tools are publicly available. Um, so anyone can uh, access, download, and run your own custom analysis or, or, or even customize our, our dashboard, which I'll show you in a moment. So uh, the data we have can, can, it can lend itself to a, a huge range of analysis. So one of the ways that uh, potential uh, users could um, make this dashboard their own is um, on the GitHub repository. So if you were to go on GitHub, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with GitHub, um, but if you go on, were to go on GitHub and to search for HNA dashboard, that would bring you to our repository. So what this means, what this allows for is for those who are familiar with the Python programming language, um, you can make use of all of the code that has been produced to, to make the HNA dashboard and download it and produce your own uh, custom dashboards using our data if you have those skills. Uh, the, 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 the dashboard is was used in, with the, uh, the Python programming language and the visualizations were drawn from the Plotly library. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Python, I'm actually really terrible at writing code. I learned that a, a long time ago. Um, there are, uh, what we have done is that we have made um, all of our data available uh, through the Borealis Dataverse network um, in the Housing Research Collaborative Dataverse. And so you can see, we already have uh, 2021 custom census data for, the, for HART available on the Dataverse network. And this 
data can be downloaded in a format that is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, that works with Excel, um, but also in a format that works with the Beyond 2020 uh, Census Browser. Uh, so you can access all of that. So I will say that um, even though the 2021 data is now available, I do recommend that users continue to refer to the 2016 core housing need data. Um, and the reason for that is that the Canada Emergency Response Benefit temporarily raised incomes for the lowest income Canadians in 2020. Um, and 2020 was the income reference year for the 2021 census. So basically, uh, many of the people in core housing need received CERB, uh, which reduced core housing need in the 2021 census. So I really do suggest that when, when you're looking at our tool uh, in the future, that you compare 2016 and 2021 core housing need data just to see if you uh, trust to ground truth the improvement in core housing need that you see in your community. And so at this point, I'm going to hand control over to Cam Power, who is going to uh, tell us about the land assessment. Great. Thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about our land assessment tool. Uh, I'll start with an overview of our objectives for the land assessment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the updates that we've made since our launch back in March. Uh, and then I'll conclude with a demo of a couple of our newer maps so we can take a look at what those look like. Okay, so with the land assessment, the issue that we're really trying to address is the issue of land cost. Um, so we know that land cost is usually one of the single biggest factors in improving the bottom line of affordable housing projects. This, this is something that's pretty intuitive in a lot of big cities across Canada, but even in small communities, uh, we're seeing land costs become prohibitive for affordable housing projects. Um, and there is this growing consensus internationally that addressing the issue of exp expensive land value is, is key for achieving affordable housing targets. Uh, this is just one example from a McKinsey report that was published in 2014. Uh, in the report, they look at four key interventions that could reduce the cost of housing projects by up to 50%. Uh, and what they found is that land cost is typically the biggest determinant of property costs uh, in large uh, cities and in some of the desirable areas that land cost can account for up to 80% of, of the cost of the property. Um, so therefore they're identifying a supply of low or no cost land can be effective, can be an effective means uh, to make projects more affordable for, for a lot of uh, communities. For local governments, typically the, the lowest cost land that they have access to is the land that they already own. Um, so one strategy to improve the, the economics uh, of affordable housing projects that's av available to local governments is to lease some of their own land uh, to nonprofit providers for housing development. Uh, and we're seeing examples of this across Canada. So the city of Vancouver recently leased 11 parcels of city-owned land to the BC Community Land Trust. In, in Ottawa, on the other side of the country, 700 homes are being built on municipal and federal lands around transit hubs. Um, this is just a couple examples, but we're seeing others across the country. Uh, so to support uh, these sort of projects, our land assessment really addresses two questions. So the first is, where is municipal, provincial, or federally owned land that could be used to reach affordable housing targets? Uh, and for our land assessment, we're interested specifically in land that's either vacant or it's potentially underutilized in the sense that it has a one or two story building that, that could be redeveloped with housing on top. And then the second question is, which of those government owned lands are well located for affordable housing? based on their proximity to different amenities. So to conduct these land assessments, we've partnered with 12 local governments across Canada. Uh, we start by uh, creating a comprehensive inventory of, of publicly owned land within their jurisdiction. Then we start to weed out some sites uh, that are probably unsuitable for development. So we look at uh, incompatible land use zones, uh, parks or riparian areas. Um, typically, this depends on the local land use planning context, so we rely pretty heavily on our partnerships to define that uh, criteria. Uh, and then we identify uh, well-located parcels based on the proximity to different amenities. And once we've completed our land assessment, we produce these maps to display the scores. Um, and currently, we publish maps for Ottawa, Whitehorse, and Victoria County. And since launch, we've been working with our partners in Alberta, Quebec, and Ontario to publish the next set of maps. So those, those maps will be released towards the end of July, or towards the end of June, sorry, or at the beginning of July. Um, but today I thought I'd, I'd demo a couple of our land assessment maps for Calgary and Hamilton, just so we can uh, take a look at what we can expect for the next batch. So 
So now we are looking at a map of Hamilton. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with the geography of Hamilton, this is Lake Ontario uh, to the east. And then to the north, you have the cities of Burlington and Oakville. Uh, where you see a, a collection of blue points, this is the downtown core. And then towards the periphery, you have some more suburban areas. Uh, each of these points represents one of the candidate parcels that are included in our, our land assessment. So um, some oh, parcels that are close together are clustered in, in these larger points that you can see on the map. Um, typically, uh, the color, I should say, corresponds to how, how the parcels score based on our uh, based on their proximity to different amenities. So um, uh, points that are in blue are, are closer to a greater variety of amenities than the ones that are in gray. Um, the pattern is, is typical of what you would expect. So you have a high concentration of high scoring sites in the downtown core, um, and in, in the more suburban and rural areas, they're they're uh, less typically less well located. In in the maps that we publish on our, our website, we have some tools that help you explore the data located on the right hand side of the screen. So you can view additional layers. You can filter by you can filter the parcels. You can generate charts and overlay your own data. Um, I mentioned earlier that we include both vacant and, and potentially underutilized sites in the maps. But if, for instance, you were inter interested in looking specifically at vacant parcels, you could open up the uh, filter by building status tab and, and remove those parcels that are occupied by our one or two story building. Um, and here I can see there, there are a cluster of sites down here by Hamilton's downtown core. So if I zoom in, I can start to see some of those parcel geometries a little bit better. Um, and then if I were to click on a site, then I receive some information about the parcel. So we include uh, the level of government ownership, uh, the zoning, so, uh, the building status, so whether it's vacant or occupied. And then towards the bottom, we have a breakdown um, of our proximity amenity score. So uh, we look at 10 amenities, so uh, things like parks, healthcare centers, schools, and so on. Uh, the amenities that we look at, look at are actually based on CMHC's own social inclusion proximity criteria uh, that they outline in the National Housing Strategy. Um, and then once we evaluate how close each of these parcels is based on walking distance, we assign each parcel a 20 points uh, a 20 point score, um, where the the high scores correspond to parcels that are near a higher variety of amenities. Um, so this parcel I can see is uh, it's a municipal parcel. It's vacant and it's it's quite well located. It's scored a 19 out of 20. Uh, and if I scroll down to look at the scorecard, it looks like it's uh, perhaps a little bit distant from a, a secondary a site of secondary education, but that's the only amenity that's that's distant based on our search criteria. Um, now I, I thought it would be kind of interesting to kind of flip over to a map of Calgary to see how it's a little bit different. So Calgary, uh, this is a map of Calgary. The something that's a bit unique is that. The amenities across Canada, Calgary are quite well distributed. So we have um, beyond the downtown core, we have well scoring sites along some arterials that run north, south, and east and west. Um, but if I look here, I can see that there are a cluster of, of sites that are maybe a little bit less well located in, in a more suburban area. So if I were to zoom in, I can see that uh, there are a lot of adjacent parcels in this area. Um, so you know that suggests maybe there's some opportunity for land assembly. Uh, perhaps creating a bigger lot that can supply a greater number of units. Um, and if I click to see how close it is to different amenities, I can see that this parcel in particular um, is close to a childcare center, a healthcare center, uh, public transit, but a lot of those other amenities like, like uh, parks and, and grocery stores are maybe a little bit distant. Um, what I should say about the tool is that even, even for the sites that score a little bit lower on our, on our amenity proximity score, um, the scorecard can reveal some opportunities for co-locating a new housing project uh, with some of the amenities that are missing in the area. So maybe there's opportunity for mixed use development with uh, a grocery store on the bottom, for instance. Um, along the side, we have some, uh, along the side of our map, we have a few other functions. So you can generate a chart that outlines the candidate parcel area by ownership, um, and it breaks that down by level of government. Uh, I should say Calgary is a little bit of a unique case where only municipal land is displayed, um, namely because federal land is not uh, particularly well located or it was excluded based on our criteria. Um, and we also had some difficulty uh, locating provincial land in Alberta just because of the, the particular uh, land assessment context there. Um, so usually for most of our other maps, you'd see provincial and federal land also included as categories. Um, but what we typically see is that municipal land represents the largest portion of well-located land that's well-located. Um, and perhaps this is good news um, 
this is often the most re readily developable land, developable land for uh, local governments that are looking to leverage their own uh, land supply. Um, but I'll add that this, this chart is also responsive to the filters that are applied to the map. Um, so it is kind of an additional helpful way to explore some of the data in broad strokes. Uh, some of the other features you can, if you're interested in looking at the, the parcels that are excluded, you can view additional layers and take a look at the excluded parcels. Um, and you can even add your own data using uh, this button here. Uh, so you can upload your own map layers. Uh, they're just displayed in your browser, so it doesn't persist um, after you exit the, the browser and we, the, none of the data is shared with us. Um, but it could be useful to check alignment with existing or, or planned projects. Um, or even if you have, for instance, priority development areas that you're looking to, to develop housing in. Um, so th those are our maps um, that you can expect to see over the next uh, few weeks. There are a couple important things to keep in mind. So the first is that uh, the candidate parcels that we include in, in our land assessment are really just an, an initial estimate of what's possible. Um, we're not doing a site level analysis of feasibility. Really, with the land assessment uh, process, we're trying to promote an expansive view of what's possible in, in these jurisdictions. Um, but really, promising sites should be further evaluated by the local governments for their feasibility. Uh, there are also a few data constraints um, that I alluded to earlier. So for these land assessment maps, we're focusing namely on government-owned land. Um, but future land assessments should uh, also incorporate nonprofit-owned land as sites as a, a potential affordable housing development. Um, and then finally, I'll just add that uh, because we rely so heavily on our partnerships to access data uh, and understand the local land use planning context, uh, we're not able to produce uh, or we're not able to publish maps uh, that cover the whole of Canada. Um, outside, so really, we're just publishing maps with our partner jurisdictions for now. Um, but I should, you know, I, I, I want to add that for communities that are looking to conduct similar assessments in their own jurisdictions, please do get in touch. Um, we would love to discuss how we can help with this sort of work. Um, and we've also published a methods document on our website for reference. Uh, yeah, so to conclude, it's, it's probably true that, you know, a lot of communities will look at their housing needs assessments that Craig just uh, demonstrated and feel maybe a little bit overwhelmed uh, at the scale of housing deficit in their community. Really, the purpose of the land assessment tool uh, and also the property acquisitions tool is to help local governments think a little bit more expansively about the, the types of solutions that are available to them. So as we've seen across Canada, there are vacant and potentially underutilized public lands and cities that might be leveraged to meet those affordable housing targets. Um, and as Joe will explain, uh, the acquisition of rental buildings is a tool that governments uh, might use to preserve existing affordability. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Joe. Thank you, Cam. Uh, my name is Joe Daniels, the Acquisition Strategy Coordinator with HART. And whether it's housing need or land assessment, each of our tools attempts to address a key challenge faced by municipalities. An acquisition strategy is a response to a key concern among housing professionals over the loss of affordable housing from existing rental stock, too often ignored by policymakers, despite the reality that some two thirds of low to moderate income renters obtain their housing in the unsubsidized market. Over the course of this part of the presentation, I'll give some brief numbers as context and describe the aim of an acquisition strategy, then dive into some of the tools we've been developing at heart. As we're all aware, Canada has seen a housing price boom over the past few decades, but what we've also seen is a consolidation of the rental market. As you can see on the screen, nearly 165,000 units, largely from existing stock, were bought by a single type of institutional investor, real estate investment trusts, between 1996 and 2017. This is just but one example, and I draw attention to it to signal the scale at which we need to act, and even draw inspiration from with a mission of affordability in mind. The consequence of both of these trends have meant upward pressures on rents and upward pressures on evictions. In fact, according to the balanced supply of housing node, Tenants are more than twice as likely to be evicted from a private apartment than from any other kind of landlord. And 85% of those evictions in British Columbia are of no fault to the tenant. In other words, eviction is part of the, of the business model. The results of these rental price increases and evictions are clear. And while precise figures continue to remain a challenge, over 550,000 units are estimated to have been lost between 2011 and 2021. 
When set against the reality from the 2021 census that nearly 600,000 households need shelter costs below $700 a month, it's clear that many households are not keeping up. Given the challenges to replacing deeply affordable units, such losses are a problem for the country and its national housing strategy goals. Even when correcting for inflation and moving our threshold for accounting for this loss up to $1,500 a month, or equating to about 70% of median income, we are still finding significant unit losses that exceed the goals of the national housing strategies 160,000 new build units for affordable housing. We have nearly 1 million households in need of shelter costs less than $1,000 a month. So at best, we're treading water, let alone addressing the backlog of need. The question is, what can we do to put ourselves on a much more solid foundation for building that new stock? Simply put, we need to stop the losses. Or as Tom Armstrong of the BC Cooperative Housing Federation vividly put to me, we need to make sure the red carpet we're rolling out is not rolling up behind us. So the solution that brings us here today is the development of an acquisition strategy to stabilize affordability where it remains. It is one that aims to identify and remove existing unsubsidized affordable rental housing at risk of loss from the profit-driven market by transferring it to a non-market owner. An acquisition strategy attempts to remove profit from the equation and hand the property to an entity with an affordability mandate. And it does so with the simple understanding that it's far easier to maintain existing affordability than it is to secure affordability once it has been lost. Property acquisitions have a variety of other benefits. It is a proven cost-effective plan for mitigating gentrification-induced displacement. It prevents homelessness before it happens, supporting tenants from being thrown into markets where affordability has long passed them by. Reusing and adapting existing properties can support climate adaptation for vulnerable tenants. And it does so by supporting the nonprofit sector to build out portfolios and asset management expertise it needs to develop greater autonomy from the state at a cost of between 50 to 70% of the cost of new builds in high cost markets. Acquisition is commonplace elsewhere in North America, Europe, and Asia, where it supports hundreds of thousands of units a year. In fact, Canada is an investment investor in some of these strategies in the United States, but it's fully, these are fully integrated into national housing strategies. The policy infrastructure for acquisition of multifamily rental properties across Canada is uneven, perhaps ad hoc at best, but there are important steps that municipalities across Canada can and should take to ensure acquisition can be a critical tool, perhaps as BC is hoping to demonstrate with its $500 million rental protection fund. At heart, our goal is to develop a series of policy tools to push Canada in that direction. This started with a policy database of policies from around the world, from which we have published our acquisitions report containing analysis of best practices. From that, we've crafted a series of how-to guides that lay out how governments can implement those practices. Our database contains over 100 different acquisition strategies from around the world, ranging from small pilots to large-scale tax incentive programs. And we have developed a map interface that allows you not only to look at policies in particular cities, but see how they are nested with policies created by higher orders of government. There are examples that can provide guidance to federal, provincial, and municipal governments alike. In fact, even where funding is provided by federal or provincial orders of government, it's often the innovative delivery of those funds by municipalities that most impacts the success of an acquisition program. Our database can be a way to explore these innovative models to design something that works for your municipality. Each entry provides essential information about the program, including its name, the properties it targets, the funding organization, funding amounts, and information on its core features. And you can use this in examples as examples in reports to councils or legislatures to make an acquisition policy concrete for stakeholders with the decision-making power. Our acquisitions report is the culmination of a year of work, analyzing our property acquisitions database and conducting interviews with our government partners. The primary takeaway from this acquisition report is that while there are promising practices in Canada and elsewhere, there's not yet the funding environment to support them to have the impact necessary to establish acquisition as a self-sustaining practice. Critically, we need more funding provided by federal and provincial governments to not only make acquisition commonplace, but to help it multiply the current investments in new supply. This is where BC is already beginning to heed the call, but 500 million will not last forever. And an effort should or can and should be made 
to ensure acquisition can be a lasting tool beyond the life of such resources. And that starts with municipalities helping to establish the infrastructure and capacity for acquisition that can self-sustain regardless of the resources available to put pressure upon provincial or federal leaders as well. The report brings together many the many pieces of an acquisition strategy that have emerged over the past decade or so in one place to give governments, housing providers, advocate and advocates a clear picture of what an acquisition strategy could be in Canada. The result are six best practices, which we recommend for all governments interested in protecting the declining stock of affordable homes we have left. These best practices were designed to apply to all orders of government, but as I go through them, I'll highlight where municipal action can focus its attention. First, we recommend governments and housing providers work together to systematically identify buildings based on shared criteria. Simply put, we should not be trying to find properties by way of whack-a-mole surprise. We should create a system that identifies buildings that could be acquired and put in place early warning systems that give municipalities or communities power to act. Here, municipalities can build out data infrastructure or establish databases in cooperation with their housing partners to track buildings and request the power to acquire data and sale information from landlords. Second, we recommend acquisitions programs have strong affordability parameters for acquired properties. The starting point will need to be flexible, but focus centrally on both the term of affordability and for how we might grow affordability over time, either in depth or number of units. This is key for many Canadian municipalities where rent costs mean that acquired buildings are likely to be at higher rent averages at the point of initial purchase, but should put mechanisms in place to ensure affordability is secure in perpetuity. Third, Acquisitions program delivery should ensure streamlined, sustained, and dedicated funding. This means reducing the time needed between application to receiving funds to less than 60 days. Toronto has demonstrated this is possible with a pre-qualification process for nonprofits, and in BC, the Rental Protection Fund has done the same. It means delivering funds over the long haul and be focused on the task of acquisition. Heeding these suggestions will allow nonprofit entities to acquire at the speed of the market within the market without disadvantage, and municipalities can support this in big and small ways to ensure funds get delivered quickly. Fourth, we recommend governments focus on building out the capacity of the nonprofit sector. Efforts should focus on nonprofit capacity in the area of active asset management. This will require not only startup support for acquisition activity, but an encouragement of nonprofit housing providers to scale up their operations, whether through entrepreneurial growth or through mergers and cooperation to gain the economies of scale needed to sustain acquired buildings with minimal operational support. From selecting sectoral champions to building cross-sectoral funding cooperation, such as Quebec's Plancher, we need to focus on scaling up at the sectoral level. And municipalities can be key agents for formally organizing such cooperation. Fifth, we recommend governments fund and coordinate programs across all scales of government and civil society. We recommend large-scale federal and provincial funding programs so that way this tool can be available to all communities where it's suitable, not just the large or sophisticated few. And we recommend governments aim for common requirements, common applications, and common timelines, deferring to local or provincially developed schemes. Often this means that such a program should be delivered through a single vehicle in each province. And this might be a vehicle like the emerging BC Rental Protection Fund, but critically should also mean ensuring alignment of requirements with such a fund in other municipalities in accordance with the regional nature of housing. And six, we recommend governments deliver acquisitions programming alongside supportive policies and legal powers. These might include the strengthening of rent controls or the permitting of new legal powers such as a first right of refusal, or even rewriting the tax code to give incentives to owners of buildings to sell to nonprofits by reducing capital gains or other kinds of tax credits. Or in the case of municipalities specifically, to waive local development or property taxes to support nonprofit acquisition. These recommended best practices set the direction towards which all government should aim to enable acquisition as a policy tool. It should be not left in the tool shed to rust. There are a myriad of ways in which we can advance these practices and our team has created a series of how-to guides to help governments do just that. These take the form of six very short two to four page guides, which communities can use to organize their plans for an acquisition strategy. They are presented for all orders of government to ensure there is clear visibility on where to collaborate and where to push ahead. They also inform the steps the government can take even before major funding has been committed. 
Together, they provide the map of a comprehensive acquisition strategy, but each individual practice can be acted upon independently. These are available now, and so let's take a quick look at an example. Our acquisitions report is the, oh, I'm sorry, oh, went the wrong direction. These can be accessed by going to our website and selecting acquisitions tools under the drop down menu, and then scrolling down to a large button that directs you to the how to guide. Each guide contains a brief intro that tells governments why this action or best practice is vital to a wider acquisition strategy, containing elements that require action on data collection, program design, and funding. Two of these three, municipalities can play a direct role in even before funding comes available. For example, our first guide makes suggestions about how to identify properties you might support for acquisition. Each guide then identifies three to five critical steps that governments can take to support the achievement of each action or best practice. Throughout, we make sure to note when it might be possible to act even if all elements in the guide cannot be accomplished at once. You can identify these with a little megaphone icon. In other instances, we provide useful examples identified with the location icon with a link to find out more. For example, in this guide, the first step is to determine eligibility for buildings to acquire. We provide possible criteria you might consider. If capacity is low, this step might be all that's necessary to start on a path towards supporting acquisition of at-risk properties. But moving on to steps two and three can give bite to the identification process, each step progressively realizing a more comprehensive incorporation of acquisition into housing policy that is mutually supportive of other interests. Each guide then concludes with a summary of the actions different tiers of government can take to support these steps. While we try to spell out specific actions, it's clear that responsibility is to be shared and supported in a way that best matches each order of government's strengths. What should be clear though, is that acquisition strategy does not have to be isolated from other housing policies. Actions made to make acquisition more successful also advance other priorities. Data developed can enable understanding of housing need, new processes developed to streamline government action can be deployed elsewhere, and new powers developed can advance other policy priorities, such as opening more land for future affordable development. Acquisition policy does not mean protecting the present at the expense of the future. Instead, pursuing acquisition strategy development is about expanding future growth opportunities for the affordable housing sector. And with that, I'll pass it back to Craig. Thank you, Joe. I'm going to briefly talk about our next steps and what is coming. Um, so we do have uh, 2021 census data on hand. It is currently being processed, and it will be added to the HNA dashboard uh, by the end of this month for most of Canada. We have a, a snapshot of our for housing need uh, by income category. So we can see that very, you know, in 2021, even despite CERB, that there were 69% of the very low income households were in core housing need and 37% of the low income households were in, in core housing need. Uh, when we take a look at the, uh, the, the sort of household site breakdown, we see that again, that very low and low income uh, categories across the nation are mostly driven by one person households, but as we get up the income spectrum, the prevalence of larger households does uh, increase. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the overall uh, sort of Canadian core housing need for 2021 was at 10% 10, 10 for households, uh, single mother led households and refugee claimant led households were had the greatest uh, rate of core housing need across the country. Um, and I did want to point out that we have, for our 2021 data order, we have added a new field um, to include a uh, core housing need for households that include a member who is transgender or, or non-binary. Non so um, it's worth noting that our next uh, main phase of, of HEART is that we have been funded by uh, CMHC to assist municipalities with their housing needs assessments in support of a housing accelerator fund proposal or to provide housing need assessments uh, for any for proposals to any other program that is designed to increase Canada's housing supply. So if you're interested in uh, working with us uh, for to generate a housing need assessment for your community, uh, we have been funded to do so 
uh, for the next for the next year. So please do get in touch. Um, as has been mentioned before, uh, in about a month, uh, we will have capacity to take on new land assessments uh, for your communities, and we'll be conducting those on a cost recovery basis. So please do get in touch if you are interested in uh, getting a land assessment for your community, and we can begin that discussion of setting up that relationship. Uh, and finally, in the fall, uh, we will be launching an e-learning course uh, that will teach users how to make the most of the tools that we have produced. Uh, and so we're going to start in the Q&A. We already do have a, a couple of questions um, in, the, in the chat. So uh, the first question that I have came from Mylene Vincent uh, from New Brunswick. And the question was, um, is this data available for municipalities with fewer than 5,000 people? And to demonstrate this, the answer is yes, but with an asterisk. Um, so I looked up, uh, brought up uh, Shadiac in New Brunswick. Uh, it's a relatively small place. Um, not sure the exact population, but this does uh, provide a, a good demonstration because what can happen um, as we get to fewer households in core housing need, particularly when we get into the priority populations, is that um, when uh, the sort of the number of households that are in core housing need and are of a particular priority population gets quite small, uh, then what happens is that the uh, software, um, the Beyond 2020 software that, that we use to do this analysis automatically suppresses uh, those numbers. So what we can see here is that for Shadiac in New Brunswick, um, we have no data on, you know, visible minority households, black led households, new migrant led households, and, and so on, because there are that doesn't and that doesn't mean there are no, no no households of that priority population that are in core housing. It just means that the number of them are are, are too small to report, and the reason for that is uh, for protection of privacy. However, we have built in a uh, a means of addressing that to a certain degree which is to make it so that should you be looking for a community that is very small and you find that um, a lot of the data is just suppressed because of that, um, right up at the top, we have the, the button. So this is the census subdivision, the municipality of Shadiac. We can click on um, the, the census division, which will automatically scale up to the region of Westmoreland. And so there will be more data available uh, uh, for that for that region. So we've, we've done this so that you know, smaller communities we know that the data, you know, the quality, you know, it, it gets hard to report on the data as the geography gets smaller and the communities get smaller. So we built in this regional tool to at least provide some information. And then it's really quite simple to uh, click right back to the uh, to the Shadiac uh, or whatever census subdivision you happen to be looking at. Uh, the second question that uh, I've received is from Scott Leon. Hello, Scott. Um, so the question was, is the disaggregated data in the HNA dashboard available in .ivt files? Uh, that is the file format that is compatible with the Beyond 2020 Census Browser. And the answer to that question is yes. Uh, in our uh, in the uh, Borealis for Hazard Research Collaborative Dataverse, uh, that those files are available. So here is where the 2021 uh, Heart Census data is located, and you can scroll down and can see that we have uh, our IVT tables that have, um, we, we marked that there, that have the, uh, and then this is, so this would be the table in IVT file format for all census subdivisions in Ontario. You can download that right now and begin exploring that information. Great, so um, those are the questions that I had to address. Um, Ray did, or Sam, did you wanna step in to manage the Q&A session? Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, absolutely fantastic. And and for others, please uh, use the Q&A function to ask additional questions. Uh, there was a question from Kezia in the chat, and maybe Joe, you can handle this one, asking what, what, what kind or what kind of instances of affordable housing stock would an acquisition program target if a lot of affordable housing is already owned by municipal and nonprofit organizations? Yes, so these would largely be properties that are not owned by nonprofits not owned by governments currently. And so they would be private housing, but largely housing that for, for whatever reason, and there's a variety of reasons they would be, um, are often renting with significant number of units below market rate. 
So they have a, a relative affordability to the market. These would not necessarily be your deepest affordable uh, apartments possible. Um, but what then would happen, what would happen is a nonprofit might be interested in acquiring such a building and needs a bit of support. So then this the, the state in some fashion could facilitate that either by providing low interest loans and also a capital grant to sort of cover the gap between what the nonprofit could afford to pay for the building and maintain its affordability and what a private actor might be able to do. And so it enables the, the acquisition of a private property to maintain its affordability at its current state with the idea that it that nonprofit ownership would enable the growth of that affordability over time, as well as potentially redevelop the site in a 10 year, 20 year span. Uh, so it's a long-term strategy for ensuring that the stock of affordable housing is actually growing rather than just managing what currently exists. Thank you very much, Joe. And let me say that I've been diving into acquisitions for the past year and a half. And when I read the, the guidebook, I thought, wow, they've hit all of the major points and a few that I hadn't thought of, which was fantastic uh, as well. So very, very practical resource. Um, Craig, there's another question about uh, data files. It's time for Saskatchewan. Sure, let me take a look. Um, Saskatchewan sets the subdivisions. Let's take a look. Uh, I actually just asked our data manager, Craig, and they great. were uploaded during the webinar. So you Amazing. can find the Saskatchewan IVT files uh, on Borealis now. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, uh, so, and let me let, let me also say, uh, Cam, the the land assessment resource. What I what I love about that, different from a lot of government policies in the past that only looked at at so called surplus land. This is looking at land that might have existing structures that could still be leveraged for for infill or for future redevelopment. And I think that's an important resource. Yeah, I think certainly that it's it's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, projects, for instance, being developed on top of things like uh, libraries or, or uh, fire halls. So it's you know sometimes useful to consider publicly owned land that's available on those on those parcels. Um, something else that's maybe a little bit unique about uh, our land assessment is that we typically when these sorts of assessments are conducted in the past, we're looking at surplus municipal lands in particular. Um, so we do kind of try, it's it's our goal to have kind of this expansive view that incorporates not only municipal land, but uh, provincial and federal land that, that could also be um, leveraged through uh, land transfer in order to, to, to you know, reach those those affordable housing targets. So those are those are a piece of the puzzle that we try to include in in our assessment maps as well. Yeah, a fantastic tool and a fantastic resource. So uh, thank you all, those of you who joined us on the webinar. But please join me in thanking our panelists from from the Heart uh, Project and the Heart team. Um, we're so happy that CHRA is able to bring you webinars like this one. Uh, if you've got ideas for other webinars you'd like to see from CHRA, please use the chat and let us know. We're always excited to be able to connect with our members and fellow housers across the country. Uh, so Craig, Cam, Joe, and Sam, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for sharing this fantastic work that you've done. Our work is always stronger when it's data-driven and this is certainly a big step in that direction. Thank you all for your interest in, in this project and, and, for your, and for your support. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, everybody, and have a good day.